All right, guys, here we go. Last review video. Let me share my screen. It's social psych. Uh, some stuff we've definitely gone over in the last couple of days, last week or so. Um, so hopefully a lot of it sounds familiar to you, but all right. So here it is. So like I said, last one, social psychology. Um, you start out here with the attribution theory. Remember, that is how we attribute our behaviors or other people's behaviors, beliefs, attitudes. It's how we take credit or it's how we, we place blame. Okay, uh, Situational, that is you blame the situation. You, you blame your surroundings, your environment for our behaviors. Okay, This kind of corresponds directly with external locus of control. It's not our fault. It's not our problem. Something outside of our control happened right so um you know I, I i missed a fly ball for example because the sun was in my eyes not because i'm just not very good at at you know catching fly balls uh dispositional you blame a relatively permanent trait of the person um you know uh such and such isn't successful because they they don't have a very good work ethic or such and such is very successful because they work really hard for it they they have a good work ethic okay that is internal so this directly corresponds with internal locus of control so situational external dispositional internal uh self-serving bias take credit if it's good um, or we throw out an excuse or or we shift blame if it's not good okay so we automatically give ourselves the benefit of the doubt this is a lot like confirmation bias right we want to be right we want to uh, be thought of it in a very positive light so self-serving bias how can i serve my myself best how can i make myself uh look best right so again if i do something good i take credit for it i studied i worked hard you know th this is something i've really prepared for if not, you know, it, it's the teacher's fault. It, it's a situation's fault. It's somebody else's fault. Okay. So I'm always going to look out for numero uno first. Uh, just world phenomenon. You guys know that uh, the world is just, the world is fair. You get what you deserve. Again, uh, you know, good things happen to good people. Excuse me. Um, you know, it, it's as simple as that. You know, if uh, something bad happens to somebody, well, they had it coming. Uh, you, you can blame the victim, right? Something bad happens to to a victim if they were jumped in an alley or something like that. Well, why were they walking in that alley in the first place? Who does that? Okay. Actor observer, uh, we judge ourselves differently than others. Okay. We judge ourselves differently than others. Let's go back to that baseball thing. Okay. When I miss a fly ball, it's because the sun was in my eyes. It was because the wind was so strong. Um, it, it was because uh, a car drove by and the, the sun reflected off there, off the, the window or windshield. And, you know, I, I missed the fly ball. Okay. But when somebody else misses the fly ball, it's because they suck. It's because they're not uh, that good at baseball. Okay. So we judge ourselves differently than we judge other people. Self-fulfilling prophecy, whether you think you can or you cannot, you're right. I want to say that was Henry Ford. Henry Ford might have that quote, but whether you think you can or whether you think you cannot, you're right. Meaning you can talk yourself into something, right? Go back to um, taking the AP exam. You no, know, if you think you can pass the AP exam, you're probably pretty likely to study for it, for a review for it, to prepare for it. If you don't think you can pass the AP exam, well, you're probably not putting in much effort. You're probably not reviewing. You're probably not studying. You're probably not preparing the way you should. So it's probably going to play out exactly how you told yourself. Well, if I tell myself I can pass it, then I actually do stuff. I'm going to pass it. Self-fulfilling prophecy. If I tell myself I can't pass it, I'm not prepared. I'm, I, 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 it's just not in the card, so to speak. Well, then you're probably not going to spend time watching these reviews. You're probably not going to spend time doing the Google Docs, and then you're going to fail. You were right. Uh, false consensus effect. That's this belief that we think a lot of people think the way that we do, okay? Uh, that we think our opinion fits what most other people think. Again, you get into politics and stuff like that. You get into uh, heuristics, okay? Uh, that, that's a false belief, okay? You might have that belief, but that doesn't make it true. Uh, it, it's very egocentric, okay? So we have this belief that most people think the way that we do. Uh, cognitive dissonance, man, we've been hammering this quite a bit. Cognitive dissonance, remember, it's the tension, it's the discomfort that mentally we feel when our behaviors don't really match up with our beliefs, okay? So when we do something that we know we probably should not do, that is cognitive dissonance, okay? Now, it doesn't apply to everybody, right? Some people can act like a dirtbag and it doesn't bother them, but maybe their beliefs don't don't conflict to their behavior. Maybe they have a dirtbag belief, and that's why they have dirtbag behaviors. But for th those of you guys who know what you should be doing, but you do the opposite anyways, 
you probably have some kind of discomfort there, right? You probably have some kind of guilty conscience. You might have some kind of regret. You might end up apologizing, you know, quite a bit to, to try to make up for that. That's cognitive dissonance, okay? Uh, if I can't remember what it was, but Abraham Lincoln, right? Abraham Lincoln was, was working at, at a store and somebody overpaid and they didn't get their change. And it said that Abraham Lincoln walked miles to return their change, right? Cognitive dissonance. He didn't feel good about keeping that money. Uh, so those, those kind of people who do that, you know, they could apologize. They could go out of their way to make up for it. Uh, they could have a guilty conscience. Sometimes they turn to defense mechanisms. Uh, they'll rationalize why they did that. You know, they know they weren't supposed to cheat on that quiz, but they, they did it anyways, because other people were cheating as well. Okay. Um, or the teacher didn't do a good job teaching material. So I needed to, to cheat. Okay. That's just rationalization for a defense mechanisms. Um, remember, you know, some conflicts up here, approach, approach. That's when you have to choose between two good things. You have to choose one. Okay. So do I really want to go out and hang out with my friends or do I need, uh, to, or should I, um, study for my for my test that I want to do a good job on. Okay. You want to do both, which one are you going to choose? Approach avoidance. That's choosing between something you want to do and something you don't want to do. Okay. Uh should I, like me, should I um go have drinks with the buddies after school or should I go home and mow? Okay. Avoidance, avoidance. You got to choose between two things you don't want to do. Okay. Um so let's think here. Um you know for let's just go with for me. Uh do I want to go down? and uh, chaperone a bunch of kids watching this assembly that's coming up, okay? Or do I want to make a, a YouTube video that takes a lot of time, okay? I'd like to avoid both of those, but I've got to choose one. Uh, persuasion, okay? We haven't really talked about the top two. We have the bottom three. Uh, central route to persuasion, okay? So if you've got to convince somebody else, the central route is the direct route. You should use facts. You, you should elaborate your points. You should bring in examples. You should show data. It's a very process-driven argument, right? It, it's exactly how it should be. It, it, it's academic. It's intelligent, okay? That is a central route. That means, boom, you're right to the point. Peripheral route is your opinion. It's using emotion, right? It's low levels of actual data. In fact, it's low levels of elaboration. It's kind of just uh, quick thoughts, okay? It, this is my opinion. I, I'm very emotionally tied to this opinion, and you should have the same opinion that I do. Okay, so think about how most people argue, let's just go with like politics. Okay, think about how most people talk about Trump or how most people talk about Biden. Were they really using a lot of facts? Okay, or were they just using their emotion? Were they using maybe uh, things that they have heard, but it's not necessarily factual? Okay, so it's central route and peripheral route. Uh, foot in the door technique. Remember, you ask for a small thing, you get your foot in the door, you ask for a small thing. And then once they say yes, you ask for a big thing. Okay. So it's difficult for a person to say no after they said yes. That's kind of a small form of cognitive dissonance. Okay. They just told you, yes, they would help. They know the right thing to do is help. So they just agree to help you. They're already in the process of helping you. You ask for another thing. Are they really going to say no? Okay. Chances are they won't. Door in the face. This is where you ask for something big first. Now, chances are you actually know it's going to be turned down, okay? But because they turn you down, you followed up with a small thing, a request for a small favor. Now, if they refuse, you could ask again. You could ask for something even smaller, okay? Typically, they're not going to keep saying no. Not every single request is going to be followed up by no, because again, it's some type of cognitive dissonance. The person knows they should help you. The person knows, uh, you know, Good people uh, will, will lend a hand, right? They will be helpful. They will be assisting. So if, if you ask for $50 for gas, you know, a friend might say no. Okay, well, okay, how about $20 for gas? Well, they might say no again. Well, how about $5 for gas? Okay. Now, do they want to keep saying no? It, it sounds like you need something. It sounds like you need somebody to help you. Uh, so cognitive dissonance might convince them to, to say yes. Low ball technique, you get them to agree to something really easy, and then you increase that request to something bigger, okay? Uh, you move a table, then you move a, a heavy couch, okay? Now, it, it, it's a yes to both things, okay? Um, I, I, I would say, you know, it, the whole time you, I don't want to call it a negotiation ta tactic, but you can kind of see down there below that I have a sales um kind of like a sales, a car dealer or whatever, you know, example there, but uh, you get them to agree to something really easy. Then you increase the request to something bigger. Um, 
you know, it, it, and it could be something completely not dealing like this is actually a sales term. Okay. So low ball technique, um, uh, Let's say, uh, you just look at the example there, but let's say you're talking about selling something. You, you can sell it for a small price. And then once they agree, you can be like, well, actually, I forgot that such and such is included. So instead of $200, it's actually $250. Well, now they got to decide. I really wanted this. I liked it for $200. Yeah, it's only 50 bucks. Maybe I'll go ahead and pay $250 for it too. Uh, look there at, at, at the, the ring, okay? So you go to buy a ring. Uh, and they tell you this ring is one of a kind. You know, you can get it right here for $200. And you agree. And you get your wallet out. You get your checkbook out. You're ready to go. But then the manager says, actually, there's a note here. Um, somebody else already offered $250 on it. Do you still want it? If you do, you've got to beat $250. Well, now you got to sit there. Man, I, I do like this ring. Uh, I like it for $200. I, I probably also like it for $258, okay? And so you make another bid. Uh, you see all the time, you know, uh, the low ball technique, it, more or less, it's it's eBay, right? It's, it's a lot of stuff like that. Um, Solomon Ash experiment. Remember, those are lines. It's all about conformity. Uh, you, you have notes on it. You have a Google Doc on it. Who was the control group? Okay, Who was the experimental group? What are Confederates? Okay, So remember, he had people in on the experiment. He, he had those who were intentionally answering the wrong answer answer you know identifying the wrong line because he wanted to see if people would conform if they would if they would go along with what everyone else is okay it kind of looks at two things here it looks at informational social influence and normative social influence okay so the people who were excuse me the people who were in the experimental group okay they were not in on the study they, they were sitting there they were watching all these other people answer first why did they conform okay if they conform because they thought the other people were right you know, maybe they were sitting there thinking, uh, I, I feel like it's line B, but everyone else keeps saying line A. Am I reading it wrong? I must be reading it wrong. I, I must be confused about what the question is. And so they conform, OK, because they thought everybody else had better information than they did. Normative social influences, you normally want to be accepted. You normally want to fit in. Right. So that person was sitting there saying uh, everybody else is doing it, so I'm going to do it. Right. I, I don't want to look like the moron. OK, um, I want to I want to belong to to the crowd, you know, that that is all agreeing with each other. OK, so you conform because you want to fit in. You want to belong. Uh, Stanley Milgram. Uh, remember, this this is about obedience. This is about authority. This is about compliance. You have an authority figure telling you what to do. Are you obedient? Right. And, and when you start. When you start pushing back, when you start saying like, no, I, I think the person's in pain and they continue ordering you to, to shock that person. Do you comply? Are you compliant? OK, 65 percent of all participants went all the way to the highest voltage. Now, remember, there, there were there was an actor on the other side who was literally saying, like, stop it. Stop it. I, I, I think you're killing me. And 65 percent of all participants went all the way to the highest voltage. Right. That's shocking. Right. <laughs> That joke. Sanford Prison Experiment. Richard Zimbardo. This is about roles. This is about identity. And again, conformity. Um, random assignment. Okay. So again, there's that term. He randomly assigned just by chance, by by uh, roll of the dice, by picking you know names out of a hat. He randomly assigns you to either prisoner or guard. Um, now, very quickly, a lot of these participants conform to their roles. You know, if, if you were assigned prisoner, you started acting like a prisoner. And, you know, you didn't go through training. You weren't an actor. You know, you weren't, um, you, you know, uh, you didn't go to, to prisoner guard training for a week or you didn't go to acting school or anything like that. You just, you know, took on that role. You conform very quickly. If you're a prisoner, uh, sorry, a guard, I'm going to say guard first time. Uh, if you're a prisoner, you just kind of, you know, you were obedient. You conformed. Uh, you thought less of yourself. Uh, when they told you to do stuff, you did it. OK, now there's a lot of criticisms, criticisms here. Uh, there was not an experimental group that received an independent variable and there was not a control group that received a placebo. He really just did like a, a really, really interesting, fascinating, borderline dangerous uh, study. Right. Not so much an experiment. Um, he more more just like a, a study on role conformity, more or less. There it wasn't a double blind procedure. He knew who everybody was, and the people, participants, they knew who the prisoners were and they knew who the guards were. Okay. There was a terrible violation of, of APA ethics. There was all kinds of um deceit and deception involved in it. Uh, people were being harmed. Um, they 
they, they kind of left very abruptly and there wasn't a lot of debriefing and stuff like that. Um, it, there was a lot of ethical violations in here, but we saw that people do conform. People do identify to the roles that they've been assigned. Uh, diffusion of responsibility. This is where you feel less likely to take action when other people are around. Okay, so if there's a fight at school, you probably don't step in because you're waiting on someone else to do it. If someone's being bullied, you don't step in because nobody else is stepping in either. Uh, de individual de-individuation. That is a temporary loss of your self-identity. If you guys remember last year in sociology, we watched the Steve Bartman video where he's the Cubs fan that reaches over, gets the foul ball. Then there's like 43,000 people who start throwing beer at him and start cussing at him, start saying stuff that you should never say to other human beings. They they stay at the stadium because they all want to beat him up and, and they like literally run up to him and, and tell him to put a, a shotgun in his mouth and pull the trigger. I mean, just terrible stuff. It was de-individuation. They lost their identity. These people, these 43,000 people lost their minds, and they literally just became a part of a crowd. They stopped seeing themselves as individuals, and they just saw themselves as a big part of a mob. Bystander effect, that's when somebody needs help, right? You are less likely to help someone when others could also help you. So again, you are less likely to help someone when others should help. It, it's, it's a part of diffusion of responsibility, like we just talked about. You know, diffusion of responsibility could be like you're less likely to answer a question, you know, when, when you are in a full class, right? So a teacher asks a question and you're not going to answer it because you're waiting on somebody else to answer it, okay? Bystander effect is more, to, you know, directly designed to um, why some people don't help people in need. Um, and again, they're, they're always waiting for someone else to step in. Uh, in group versus out group bias. I mean, do we look at our friends differently than those not in our friend group? I mean, think about, um, you know, think about it. If a, uh, if one of your friends was aware, you know, a, a certain outfit or whatever, and then somebody not in your friend group was aware of that same outfit, would you really judge them? Would you really have the same kind of bias towards them? Um, if, if a friend was to say something to you, and somebody who's not your friend was to say the exact same thing to you, would you have a different reaction? Okay, so you have an in-group bias versus an out-group bias. Uh, fundamental attribution error gets to that, you know, how we decide to shift blame, uh, how we decide to, to treat people outside of, you know, ourselves or outside of our group. Uh, some terms there we went over last class, but social facilitation, the social setting helps you perform better, right? You want to achieve, you want to succeed with witnesses around you. Right. So when it's a packed gym, you play better in your volleyball game. When it's a packed gym, you play better in your basketball game uh, because you want people to see you doing well. Social inhibition. Uh, you might be a really good server in practice, you know, when there's no fans there. But as soon as you have to go into a game and serve in front of a, a you know, a big crowd, it hurts your performance. Okay. You cannot handle that social situation. And so your your performance decreases. Social loafing. That's when you're part of a team um, and you actually do less in a group setting than if you were solo. Think about the amount of group projects or partner projects you've done in high school. OK, uh, did you do as much in that group project than if you were solo? Chances are probably not. OK, hostile aggression. That is when violence or harm is the purpose. Uh, probably crimes of passion, right, where, where you you flip a switch, you go crazy, um, you lose control, you lose your temper, whatever. And, and there's violence, there's aggression. It, it's emotional. OK, you lose impulse control. That is it, it's more spontaneous, but aggression or violence or harm is the purpose. Um, instrumental aggression. That's when aggression is used to get you something. OK, so it's more premeditated. You are going to use aggression to to rob a store okay or you are going to use aggression you're going to use the the threat of harm to get a kid to give up their lunch money right if you're a bully okay so you have hostile aggression that's um hostility and aggression is more spontaneous it's impulse control um it's losing your temper instrumental is more again you're using it like a tool you're using it like an instrument to get you something it's more premeditated um, the rest of it, I think it, it really just goes hand in hand with the Google Doc I already sent out. Um, so I, I would make sure you are putting time in and reviewing that, uh, that Google Doc, you're finishing it, you're doing a good job, and then you're studying it. And this is it. This is the last one. So you have all the Google Docs and you have all the videos. Uh, if you've been keeping up with it, if you've been doing the, the 
you know, Ebbinghaus is spacing effective. You've been doing distributed practice where you not just, you know, complete the doc, but you actually spend a few minutes here and there reviewing the doc, then you're off to a really good start. Okay. If not, I mean, today's Friday, um, you'll have everything you need by the end of uh, before school's out. Um, so you have everything, right? Uh, tomorrow, obviously, it's prom day. I don't know. What are you doing in the morning, right? Can, can you spend 45 minutes, an hour studying in the morning, reviewing in the morning, uh, maybe at lunch or whatever? I, I don't know. But you probably can find some time on Saturday. Sunday, it is what it is. It's the day after prom. Uh, but again, you're only 48 hours away from the AP psych exam at that point. Um you have all the rest of the school year, the summer to, to take naps and to be tired and whatnot. So put in the time now. Um, and then Monday, obviously, is, is a big day as well. OK, so uh, if you guys have any questions, shoot me an email. Come find me. No problem at all. Uh, just again, I mean, you only have a few days left to prepare. So highly recommend you put in that time, you put in that effort. All right. Thanks, guys.